for that warm so thank you so much for the warm introduction and i take privilege uh, in joining this session and i definitely hope that all the participants who have joined today have an insightful session and definitely learn something which will be helpful for them into their digital lives okay so without further ado uh, i would start with the session sir sure sir over to you sir okay. thank you so much okay so hello and welcome all the participants thank you so much for joining in today i am going to talk about endpoint device and mobile phone security in which we are going to understand about what are endpoint devices what are mobile phone uh, security devices what are the various attacks that can happen on endpoint and mobile both types of devices then we are going to discuss about security aspects of it and patch management issues along with which we are going to perform a practical as well in which we are going to understand that how if we do not keep our cells or our devices up to date and do not follow the patch management standards how any threat actor could possibly get access to our devices and what kind of sensitive information can be exfiltrated from our infrastructure or our environment so i would like to start from here now first what are some of the common endpoint devices that we generally use if we talk about endpoint devices that we use on a personal level or at an organizational level here is the list of most common endpoint devices like mobile phones laptops desktops servers tablets workstation and other virtual environments like a virtual machine which is running uh, linux or any other operating system so we generally find these common endpoint devices running at organizations and also at an individual level as well so what is endpoint device security and why it is important we see that every day in this digital era there are various attacks exploits and tactics that are been uncovered by various threat actors we see possibly that every new day there is a new cve that arises for a specific software service or a hardware device just to iterate an example one of the cve that was released recently in the firmware of routers which were running an unpatched version of an older software which could allow an attacker to get access to the router configuration and then modify the configuration in the router which makes all the users of that network redirect to a third party attacker controlled domain name so that is why the endpoint device security is very important so here are few some of the points that we can keep as in measure so that we tend to be safe from these attacks first is strong passwords now many endpoint devices like a router or maybe a switch in which an organization would have configured it an infrastructure their usernames and passwords are generally kept as default username and passwords like admin admin or admin password so if an attacker or an internal employee of the organization gets access to the routers or the gateways page with the default credential as admin admin he would be able to see the list of devices connected their uptime mac addresses total internet bandwidth etc giving one more example if an organization is using an internal panel maybe an admin panel for development if it is get if it gets exposed to the public internet and is running a default username and password it could easily be accessed by an threat actor we have seen in past that 
attackers are able to get access to the organization's entire infrastructure by just a simple default username and password. Just for an example that I can recall that we identified in one of the pen test engagements was an organization running a publicly available server onto their device. The publicly available server had a username and password, which was admin admin. Now we could get access to that application after the username and password and upload a malware. Now, as the device was connected to the organization's infrastructure into an active directory environment, the malware could pull all the details from the system by invoking requests to the active directory. This allowed us to also dump the memory of the system and get access to all the users in the organization who might have logged in into that computer. We were able to exfiltrate the username, password, et cetera, from that system and use it to log in into Microsoft Teams, Microsoft OneDrive, SharePoint, et cetera. So you can just imagine the amount of catastrophic damage that can occur by just keeping a weak password like admin, password, secret like this. The attackers can use an entire kill chain to maximize the damage that can happen to an organization. And we have been generally hearing about that we should keep strong passwords, but if we don't keep it on endpoint devices or our mobile phones, it could lead to severe damage if there is sensitive information that could be attacked or exfiltrated by the attacker. The second and the most important point is regular updates. Regularly updating the on organization's infrastructure and the devices, softwares, or maybe the patches that are continuously released for the CVEs or exploits that are being identified. Next is updating the antivirus signatures, because as we know that there are new ways that, that the attacker identifies to bypass security controls and mechanisms that are already enforced in, in our organization, we should keep our antivirus signatures updated updated by constantly checking updates. With that, we would be able to safeguard ourselves and the organization's infrastructure from any new vulnerabilities that might have been identified in the wild. The last and the most important point is encryption. Using bit lockers to encrypt devices so that the data is not used or is identified or stolen in plain text format, which would render the data useless for the attackers if they even steal it or exfiltrate it from the organization. Also, enabling two-factor authentication or in multi-factor authentication or sensitive services or applications would help organizations to strengthen strengthen their overall security posture. Here we are going to understand about the key components of endpoint security. The first is device protection that can be enabled via running up-to-date security solutions like an antivirus, keeping ransomware protection, Windows Defender on. Next is network control to actively monitor the anomalies or the logs that is happening inside an organization's network. That is to identify if there is a frequent amount of traffic or spike that is being observed by the organization's SOC team. This would help them identify if there are any malicious IP addresses or specific domain names which try to access the organization infrastructure which the traffic is not considered as genuine. Also, implementing up-to-date security standards on the network devices inside the infra so that it can, cannot be exploited. Next is application level control. Application con level control refers to the 
servers or the software that is running onto the an organization's infra. For example, if a web server for an infrastructure is running onto an older version of an Oracle software or an Oracle server, and if it is running on an outdated uh, CV or an exploit which is publicly available, an attacker can use that to gain access to the web server and then the entire device. Data control refers to the amount of privileges that a specific device would have, or the data should be processed in which manner. If the sensitive information is kept into a bit locker or through an encrypted mechanism, then the data will not be used by the attackers, or even if it is exfiltrated, would render useless. The last one is browser protection. The organization should keep the browsers that are being used up to date with regular patches. So recently, there were various CVEs that were identified in Google's Chrome browser. Similarly, vulnerabilities keep on arising on various browsers like Edge, Firefox, etc. So it is very important to keep browsers updated and to make sure that sensitive usernames and passwords are also not saved in the browsers so that if an attacker gets access to the endpoint device, they could not steal that information directly from the browser. As we have understood about different endpoint devices that could be installed into an organization's infrastructure, let us also understand one of the most vital endpoint device that is being used by every one of us, which is a mobile phone. Now, there are a few important points that you have to keep in mind. This might look like some general points that everyone should follow, but if these are not properly enforced, what possibly could go wrong? We are going to cover that in a practical. So on, in regards to the mobile phone security, there should be screen lock on a mobile device. A, a difficult screen lock would not allow anyone to access the device or view sensitive information. Second and very important thing is app permissions. And I'm very sure that a lot of users, either in a hurry or in a situation wherein they want to install a mobile application, do not see or do not focus on what kind of application permissions they are enabling. Just for instance, let me give you an example. If you're installing a calculator application into your phone, and if you see the calculator application is asking for a permission, which is calls, SMS, file storage, camera, et cetera, then it should automatically give you a red flag that no, this is something suspicious because a simple calculator application would not ask for additional permissions or privileged permissions like camera, file manager, SMS log, phone log, etc. So possibly the application is designed in a way that it might be an Trojan or a malware, which after installation onto your device, pull out all this information and send it to the attacker. Now, as in hurry, we already have ourselves not seen what permissions are we granting and just do allow, allow, allow and next and finish the installation would be very, very dangerous. So always make sure what permissions are being given to these applications that you install. If you feel like there are over permissive permissions that have been granted to a certain applications, feel free to turn it off when not, when not required or any other applications which takes over permissive uh, permissive permissions, make sure to double check what the application is meant for 
and only try to install applications via the official source, which is the Google Play Store. Now, there are various other sources on the internet where people tend to download applications from, which are not the trusted resources or trusted sources. Just for example, there are various repositories or various sources through which we can download third-party applications. One of the very famous third-party uh, resources, Aptoid. Now, it has been identified that many of the applications or mobile applications to be specific that have been uploaded on third-party repositories like Aptoid or so on are generally malwareized in some or the another manner that it takes sensitive information from your devices and upload it to the attacker server. So make sure it's a big no to install an application from any third-party source. Having said that, I can recall one of the situations recently that happened with one of my close friend. He received a WhatsApp message and a link to download a mobile application from Google Drive that was created. Now the message said that install the application to claim your, I think it was 580 rupees reward on your phone pay wallet. Now, he installed that application, allowed all the permissions, and the application was actually a malware, which started taking the call logs, reading the SMS, etc., and transferred it to the attacker server. This is one such example. Applications can be programmed in a way that it can also use your camera that is your front camera or your back camera and can turn your mobile phone into an active surveillance device through which the attacker can watch you 24 seven what activities you are doing onto your phone. So make sure you always double check for any app permissions that you are going to install. And if not required, the latest version of the Android also allows you to disable those permissions. Having said that, let's move ahead. Two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is an important step that you should enable on any of your online accounts that you use or either on the applications that hold sensitive information into your devices. For example, a banking application that you might have installed into your phone should have a 2FA. This is important because if your phone is compromised already, the attacker would not be able to get access to the mobile banking application that you have installed. Also, you should make sure that all other accounts that are connected with your mobile phone, for example, your Gmail account or your iCloud account should have a 2FA policy enforced so that even though the device tries to steal your credentials, the attacker cannot get access to that without giving your 2FA or without giving the multi-factor authentication. Securing the app downloads, make sure you do not download any third-party softwares that you do not trust. You always should only enable or install applications which are required and are from a trusted source. Remote wipe. Remote wipe is a feature that you can enable into an Android device through the Google's uh, application. So Google have an uh, application that you can install. Google provides you an application into your phone, which you can enable and which is Google's device manager. So once you install that application into your device, if you think your device is stolen and your device has sensitive information which could be accessed by someone or if you think your device is compromised you can execute a remote wipe on the device this feature is already enabled in um, apple devices like an iphone which allows you to remotely wipe your device if you think that your device is in danger or it has been compromised now 
Here's a Google search that I have just done before the session. And I just searched for Android malware infection and you can see the results already. So cybercrime gang pre-infects millions of Android devices with malware. Lemon Group uses millions of pre-infected Android phones to enable cybercrime enterprise. Cybercrime Syndicate pre-infects 8.9 million Android phones worldwide. Google Play Store, which is considered as one of the trusted resource, should only be used to install mobile applications. Google tries their best efforts in scanning all the application and monitors them continuously so that if any application is identified to be malwareized or has some kind of code that is suspicious, they make their possible best effort to remove those applications from there. But you have to keep in mind that you only install or use or access those applications which are only required for you to use. Never ever install an application from a third party source like Aptoid or any other, other third party data source from which you can download. I have seen people installing applications which gives them additional features for free, which are generally referred as modded applications. So for example, installing an application which is Candy Crush, which allows you to give or unlock, have unlocked points for you. You search for that on the Google and you get one of the application which is uploaded onto a third party website. Download it, install it, you would see that the application has full unlocked capabilities or pro features or premium features for free. But you also have to keep in mind that you will not get anything for free like that. The application is using your data in return of the paid features that you are using for free. Your data is being transferred or being stolen to these malicious third party C2 servers, wherein these attackers utilize your information to uh, sell it on deep web, dark web, or use it for various other illegal activities. Okay, moving ahead. I hope everyone is with me and able to understand so far. If you can just quickly acknowledge me in the chat box that all of you are with me on the same page before we proceed further. so that I don't feel I'm only the one who's talking. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much participants for your acknowledgement. Thank you. Uh, let's proceed further. Let's understand about password policies. Now we have been hearing continuously about passwords that, that we should not keep simple passwords, instead use a complex password. The password should have a minimum length of eight characters. We should always make sure that we make regular changes and updates to the password. And we should also enable multi-factor authentication or on any of our sensitive accounts. Now, what makes a good password? So let's assume that. Let me just go here and open a notepad editor for you for your reference. Okay, let's assume my password is Apple123. Now, this is considered a password, which is 1234567 which is eight characters long, which satisfies the eight character restriction. That's really great. In organizations, we see employees as an organization infrastructure has systems which has a password policy enforced, which should have eight characters, which should have a capital letter and special uh, symbol, okay, or a sign and numbers. Okay, so this password contains eight characters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great, eight characters. So Microsoft's password policy for keeping the password for a system or an endpoint device is satisfied here. Great. 
Now, M is capital satisfied, a special character satisfied, and numbers also satisfied. Now, I want to ask every one of you, is this considered a secure password? What do you think about it? Yeah, participant, you can use a chat box to give the answer. No. So this is not a secure password. Excellent. Organizations have an policy in which they have to frequently update their passwords. So let's say in the next month, they make their password to this. And the next month, they make their password to this. We have seen this in organizations when we perform audits, that organizations tend, tend to keep a password which is like this. So at least 20% of the employees have a very weak password, which satisfies the password policy as governed by the organization, but are considered to be weak and can easily be cracked or guessed. So what should be a strong password? A strong password should, as I said, should be greater than eight characters, greater than eight, eight characters, should be a combination of alpha, numeric and special characters. So assuming that my password is Apple one, two, three, this is a weak password. And if I go online and I check how strong is my password, this is just for uh, demonstration purposes. Okay, do not enter your real password here and check how strong it is. It is just for demonstration. So I've entered a password which is Apple one, two, three, which is eight characters long, lowercase numbers. Okay, so let me make this as capital. So it satisfied the uppercase. Let me also add in symbol at the end. So let's say I add a symbol, which is one at the rate. Now you can see nine characters long. It will only take 0 0.69 seconds with a good system which has enough computational power to crack a password like this. So it's a very big no to keep passwords, which are very simple and can easily be guessed or could be identified in a dictionary. Rather, your password should be not a guessable keyword, okay? Not a guessable keyword, okay? And it should not be your first name, last name, family name, or a guessable keyword like Apple, okay? So your password can be much more complex. which takes more time to be guessed, okay? As you can see over here, this is just one demonstration and a password like this will take a system or a computer with enough computational power to crack by doing the iterations, okay? This is just an example. Do not keep the same password, but it is just an example to motivate that what can be an example of a strong password. Now, we have understood what a strong password is, but I have seen people making mistakes that they use the same password across their various accounts. So website A, let's assume Facebook, same password. Website B, internet banking website, their internet banking account, same password. Website three, their Gmail account having the same password. And they go randomly on the internet and search for some services, websites online. So let's say I just search for a gym membership and I come across a website which is gym90percentoff.com and I sign up on this website. And I, as I know that Ranjit sir and Rohit sir has mentioned that we have to use strong passwords, I use the same password on this website. Now this website might be having weak security. So it might get compromised and your strong password is being now stolen, which is same everywhere so that it, co it could be used by an attacker to simply brute force the same password across all of your accounts, uh, Gmail accounts, social media, bank accounts, et cetera. Or this website might be a phishing website that has been created by an attacker and you're giving your strong password to the attacker directly. And as you're using the same on all the web applications or websites across, your strong password has been compromised. 
So second best practice that you have to keep is, first is keeping a strong password, which is not guessable. Second is not using the same password everywhere. Do not use the same password, even though it's strong. Make sure that you use a different strong password. Now, if you are not able to remember what are your strong passwords that they are keeping, you can use password managers locally to save your passwords. I would also not suggest keeping your passwords in a notepad file and always going back to the notepad file to see what was your password. Because if you lose access to a sticky note or a notepad file like this, all your passwords are being can be accessed by an attacker very easily. So you can use a password manager or the best thing is remember or memorize the strong passwords that you are going to use. Okay, having said that, I hope that every one of you would enforce this into your day-to-day -day life so that you keep strong passwords and do not use the same strong password for multiple websites on one uh, altogether. Okay. So let's understand about security patch management. What is security patch management? Security patch management refers to how we, in a timely manner, patch any open bugs, vulnerabilities, weakness, or loopholes in our endpoints or endpoint devices or our phones. For example, I have been getting a constant update in my phone that I should update my phone to a latest software update because in the previous version, there is a security vulnerability which has been identified, which allows an attacker to gain access to my device because my device exposes a port which anyone can use and connect to. So if anyone has a physical access to my device and my device is exposing a port, which is which can be used to create an ADB connection, this could be leveraged by an attacker to gain more access to my device. So timely patching of flaws or vulnerabilities that keep arising should be in place. Timely patch of security devices to their latest firmware or software updates should also be observed. Next is vulnerability mitigation. Talking about an organization's infrastructure, as there would be different security incidents that would be logged by the security team for the vulnerabilities that are identified in different endpoint devices like a server or maybe a network device it should be properly mitigated in a timely manner. Just for example, if a vulnerability has been identified in a big IP F5 server, which is, you, which is you used to host an application, let's say an, an internet banking application by an organization XYZ, it should be patched in a timely manner so that the attackers do not use that vulnerability to gain more higher privilege or do more damage for the organization's infrastructure or the sensitive information of the customers that has been saved into the application's database. Regularly monitoring and updating for security patches that has been released continuously should be observed. Patch deployment scheduling. This means Whenever there are new vulnerabilities that arises, which has a lower severity, there should be a proper patch management system in an organization on regular intervals that these patches should be deployed and retested in a proper duration. Just for, exa for example, Microsoft observes Patch Tuesday. Any new security patches are being rolled out if they are not urgent, are rolled out on Tuesday. Similarly, organizations can do a patch deployment scheduling in time-to-time -time manner and also validate if the patches have been deployed 
correctly as intended. Patch priorita uh, prioritization includes if a specific security risk that has been identified requires what time, what, how much turnaround time to be patched. If it's a critical severity risk, it should be patched immediately. The turnaround time is very less. So if it's, it's a critical issue, in 24 hours, the patch prioritization should prioritize the risk and immediately fix it so that the overall damage can be reduced, which is also known as embracing damage control for organizations. Patch validation, as I said, after patches has been deployed for the security risks identified on the endpoint devices for an organization, making sure if the patches correctly mitigate the issues that have been identified should be in place. What is the importance of patch management, you might ask? Why are there various steps involved in patch management? And how an organization will benefit from all these steps? So first thing is it enhances the overall security for an organization's endpoint devices. As effective patch management, once deployed, will make sure that the organization's infrastructure or attack surface is less prone to the attacks that could have been done from external threat actors. Second, it supports bring your own devices. Organizations have enforced policy to bring your own devices in which least interaction to the organization's infrastructure is maintained so that they do not have to enforce privileges or access controls required for employees onto their systems. Patch management also helps detect outdated softwares that might be running into their organization's infrastructure. So just for example, as per OWASP top 10, there is a category which says insufficient logging and monitoring in which organizations do not even know for a period of three months to a year that their organization is running an outdated software or their organization is already compromised by a threat actor. That is because of not implementing SOC or monitoring as well as not identifying what are the updated patches that are required for older software, which are then in turn exploited by external threat actors to get access to an organization. And they try to gain the access and maintain access for a longer period of time, due to which they would be able to get a steal uh, sensitive information for a long period of time. Next, prevents interruptions in productivity. That's definitely yes. If specific servers are running or endpoint devices are running outdated softwares, the turnaround time is very less. It would definitely uh, hinder the availability as per the CIA triad because at that time it would undergo uh, the patching, which would not allow users or maybe the organization's employee to use those assets for that specific time frame. So implementing effective patch management also prevents interruptions in productivity and keeps the CIA triad's availability in place as well. Provisions timely feature updates, as I mentioned already, and it drives innovation. That is, organization is able to perform in a productive manner, less frequent, uh, less frequent downtimes, and lesser number of security risks remain open. So the overall posture of the security of the organization increases in this manner. Let's understand about data backups. Backup is considered as the most important key factor from an 
organization and from a user perspective both. Frequent data backups are required for sensitive information that might be stored by an organization for their endpoint devices. Also, it is important in terms of how threat actors are using day-to-day -day new malicious techniques. For example, I'm definitely sure that you all might be aware about a ransomware. A ransomware works in a fashion in which after getting on the system, it infects the system and encrypts all the sensitive information, including files, folders, or other data, which is in very simple terms, locked or encrypted and cannot be accessed by the organization. Now in return, the threat actor who has infected the organization through the ransomware would ask for a ransomware in return in which he would provide a decryption key to the organization through which they would get hold or get back their data. So data backups are considered to be very vital in, in the cases wherein if there is an unforeseen circumstance that arises like this, important data can be retrieved very quickly from the restore points or the data that has been kept in the regular backups. Next is offsite storage. Now keeping the backup of a system on the system itself is not a good move. And I'm sure all of you would agree to that because if an endpoint device backup is kept on this endpoint device itself, and if it gets encrypted through a ransomware due to an unforeseen circumstance, then the data backup would render useless. So there should be definitely offsite storage, which means storing this data backups in a very secure, isolated place, which is not in, connected with the systems. So that even though the malware would do a lateral movement in the infrastructure to other systems or endpoint devices would not be able to harm or create damage to, to the backups. That is why offsite storage are very important. Automated backups, that is timely frequent backups or creating frequent restore points for important data for organizations is very, very important. Data recovery testing points to how the data that has been backed up could be recovered in a very, very uh, smooth and a fast manner. If the data that has been kept as in backup is not properly validated of how the recovery process would initiate would also uh, invite downtime for the organization in these circumstances. And last one, which is encryption of the backups or the restore points is very essential to make sure that the devices backups are in a safe, secure, isolated environment, which has encryption on it so that it is not compromised or tampered with. Let's proceed further to downloading and managing third-party softwares for endpoint devices and mobile phones. We should make sure that as I have expressed this multiple times, downloading and managing third-party softwares from only trusted resources, which are being through the official sources that have been provided. Just for instance, downloading, mobile applications from a trusted source like a Google, like Google Play Store, or in case of an iOS device app store. Downloading softwares from their official websites only and validating the checksum after the download has been completed. Very less users have this habit of verifying the file or the download or, or any data that has been downloaded to verify its checksum. If your network consist of a threat actor, he or she might change the file that you are downloading or any kind of data that has been downloaded. So make sure that you always make sure the checksum of the file remains the same. And I'll show you a quick way of how to identify the checksum for any given data. 
So let's assume, I'll quickly go to this website, which is virus total. You can also use offline checksum calculators, which, has, which are available freely from Microsoft App Store and Apple App Store as well. I'll show one example from this website. So let's say I go here and I want to install a software, which is putty. So I'll search for putty.exe and go here. Now, let's say I want to download putty. So I'll go here and these are all the files that can be seen from here. So let's say putty.exe 64 bit, which is available for uh, x86 architecture. If I go and click on the signature, I would be able to see the GPG signature for this file. Similarly, you would be able to see the signatures for any other files that you download as well. Uh, giving a very real life realistic example of VLC media player. When I go and click on download VLC media player, it will start the download immediately. If I click on display checksum, you can see the SHA-256 checksum that has been generated for the file or the data that is currently in transit from the server to the client, which is me. So we have to make sure that the checksum remains the same once the download has been completed to make sure that the file is not being modified or infected while it was in transit from the server to the client. To do that, you can simply upload that file to virus total and examine its checksum using this technique. So for just example, I'm going to upload a PDF file. You can see virus total is one such website which allows you to scan a file that you have across multiple antivirus signatures as can be seen over here. For instance, Bitdefender, Avast, Escan, etc. as you can see. And the PDF file that I have just uploaded is a clean file. Hence, you can see undetected, undetected security vendors analysis is clean. Once this is done, will just, just take probably a few more seconds. After that, I would be able to see what is the signature of this file or the checksum for this file. So always make sure that you validate it so that the integrity remains intact for any of the third-party software that you download from any of these sources. Just a few seconds more. Yeah, it is completed. Let me go to details and you would be able to see the SHA-256 checksum that can be identified from here. So you can use this website as one of the resource, although there are various alternative resources to calculate the signatures of the, web, of the file or data that you have locally into your system as well, which can be used in alternate to using virus total too. But this was just an example to identify how you can validate the checksum or the hash for any given data. I close this. Let's go back to our presentation. Yeah, so the trusted sources, verification checks, keeping a version control and software inventory for anything that, have, that we are continuously downloading or into an organization's infrastructure. This should, should be a software inventory. We should validate uh, what are the uh, software patches updates that have been created. This recalls me to an attack, which was, which was a very big supply chain attack, which was solar winds supply chain attack. And the solar wind software that was used by various organizations across the globe, including Department of Defense, FBI, and other big organizations became vulnerable to this attack because the attackers pushed the malware into the solar wind software as an update into their update. So solar winds pushed this update to these organizations which were using their product and they all became uh, vulnerable and the attackers were able to access their infrastructure. So managing their version control for frequent updates and software inventory is very, very necessary. Device security policy. De device security policies should be enforced in regards with what are the acceptable use guidelines for endpoint devices into an infrastructure. 
device registration should be done that is using a single sign-on account or an admin configuration account on the devices remote wipe capability should be enforced so that in terms in in cases where an attacker or threat actor gets access to the devices the remote wipe capability can remove all sensitive information from that device security awareness training is very important in terms of how endpoint devices or mobile phones should be accessed into a safe manner and if any point of time security incident occurs there should be necessary uh, practices that should be done in terms of reporting it one very simple example would be reporting a phishing email continuously to the organization so that any new uh, phishing mails that arise from the same domain or from the same email addresses are marked as spam and are not likely to go into the inbox for other users or any other security incident that occurs should be reported in a timely manner. Let's see a quick practical. Uh, we are heading over the end of the session. So I'm going to quickly show you a practical which would take just five minutes of you. So we are going to understand about a malware which is TrickBot. As we are understanding about endpoint device security, how a malware could be downloaded into an organization's infrastructure if proper awareness is not kept and what could possibly co could go wrong this is what i'm just trying to show through in practical so trickbot is a banking trojan that can steal financial details account credentials and pii which includes your personal information like your usernames password credit card information etc as well as spread within a network and drop a ransomware which is Ryuk ransomware. This looks extremely dangerous. There is more that you can read about this onto this blog. Now, I'm going to download a sample of this quickly from here, which is malware traffic analysis. I would recommend any one of you who would, would want to do the similar exercise or practical in future, please use an isolated system or in virtual machine to do so. Don't perform these activities on your host machine because these are the samples of real malware. So I'm going to run this malware onto my system and I have created a pre-recorded video for you. So I just want to quickly walk you through of what happens when you unknowingly into an endpoint device or maybe a workstation into an organization run a file like this. So this is a PCAP capture, as you can see over here, which has been captured by execution executing the exe file that was downloaded. So in the Wireshark, so this is a Wireshark tool, I'm going to quickly look up of what is the requests and responses. That is basically the traffic that has been created by the TrickBot malware. So I'm going to choose the request that has been created to a destination IP which belongs to an attacker and you can see there is a zip file which is being requested onto my host. So I'll just follow the HTTP stream and you can see the zip file gets downloaded when I run the exe file from the attacker server as can be seen over here which is a zip file with the name dd ends with dot zip and you can see the content of the zip file can also is readable from here which is a file which is invoice and statement dot uh, link, which is basically a shortcut on for Windows computer. So once I download this, I'm going to export this object. So I'll go to export objects, HTTP, and this is the zip file. So I'm going to select the zip file and click on save through which I will be able to download the zip file because I want to examine this quickly. So you can see the zip file has been downloaded. Now I'll take the zip file to my Kali machine to analyze, to analyze it. So I'll run the file command on it and see what the zip file contains. Okay, so this is uh, in real a uh, zip archive data. So let me just unzip this file. So upon unzipping this file, you can see invoice statement.link, which is a shortcut, which comes out of the zip file. Let me just analyze this as well with the file command. And this is MS Windows, Microsoft Windows shortcut. 
So what will happen when this shortcut is being run? So this shortcut runs automatically. And once the shortcut has been run, you can see over here. So I'll just skip this examination and come to the most important part. which is this. So if you look carefully here, what has happened, the malware after running onto an endpoint device, maybe by an employee uh, unknowingly, sends this data onto the attacker server. So this, this is a post request, which means to send some post data to the attacker server on an endpoint, which can be seen over here, which is ONO19. And you can see the data that has been sent is login username of the username, his bill information, and his card information. So this financial data has been stolen from the device has been, and is being sent to the attacker server as per the examination and analysis that we can see in the background that is happening. Not only which, the malware also runs system level commands. And you can see here in the next request, from the browser, so the user or the employee on his device has accessed nytimes, newyorktimes.com, his username and password. This data is also being stolen from the browser and is being sent to the attacker server. And the last, last packet that you can see over here, so there are multiple post requests that has been transferred to the attacker server. And if we examine this one by clicking on that and clicking on follow HTTP stream, we can see in this, the malware has run a command which is proc list, which is process list. And the attacker is trying to examine all the processes, system processes that is running onto the endpoint device, through which the attacker would get more information about if there is a process like anydesk.exe, teamviewer.exe, or any other software or service that we run into our system. So all this information is also being sent if you look closely here, you can see OS name, Microsoft Windows 7, Service Pack 1, other information as can be seen over here. Next command that is being executed is IP config, which gives the IP addresses of the user's system to the attacker, as can be seen over here. And other vital information is being stolen by the attacker in real life. There are more commands which are executed, which is net view all to uh, invoke the active directory and use or identify other information. Example, net view all to see uh, the users which are in the domain. So organizations infrastructure are connected into a domain network. For example, if we talk about any organization which is ABC, so the domain would be abc.com. So you can see the attacker tries to examine the domains, domain trust, and here also domain trusts, okay? So this can be extremely dangerous for an organization if they by mistakely run a malware like this, which then exfiltrates so much of sensitive information like this, which includes credit card information, personal PII, browser information, process list, and execute commands and send it to the attacker server can be, can turn out to be extremely dangerous. So I hope everyone of you have understood what could be the consequences of not following the best practices or guidelines for endpoint devices, security, and mobile phones as well. Uh, with this, we have reached the end of the session. And I would like to thank all of you for so patiently listening to me. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Sir. So participant, do you have any question? You can drop the question in the chat box. And I'm sure that you all have learned a lot about all these techniques, including practicals and securing your devices with a strong password. Anyone have any question? You can raise your hand. I will allow you to unmute. So there is no question in the chat box. Thank you, HP. I think I cannot <laughs> see your name, it's only HP. <laughs> So previously also, sir, I was uh, keeping an eye on the chat box. We do not have any question. So anyone, any question? Anyone have any question? We can wait for, sir, one more minute if someone is typing.
Thank you, Sudha ma'am. Sudha ma'am is one of the senior advocate in cyber domain. And uh, she joined this course. I was <laughs> in the shock that what we are going to teach is such a senior and learner advocate. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for your uh, feedback. I'd appreciate. Uh, thank you for the feedback. It makes me and uh, the entire team of uh, Forensics Event and Ranjitsa very, very happy. I'm very glad. So I think it's a well explained, sir. So there is uh, no question as of now. Yes, there is one question. How to store and remember so many difficult passwords? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so as I said, uh, you can use a password manager in that case uh, that will store your passwords locally with you. So there, the password manager would have a master key. So once you provide the master key, you would be able to unlock and see all your other passwords. But if you do not trust the password managers as well, because there have been certain cases in which there have been vulnerabilities that are identified in password managers as well. So there's only one option that you can memorize your password. Yes, sir. <laughs> that is a good thing. And I still remember during our medical days, one of the resident, he asked, how do you remember all these name of the medicines? So <laughs> a simple answer, as you remember the name of your friend, we remember the name of all the medicines. <laughs> so accordingly, you can put the password with your uh, close friends, including a star has and all these possibilities to explain by sir. But yes, uh, password manager is the one of the best things. Uh, sir, they are asking for the PPT. And if it is uh, possible you share, I'll share with them in the group. Sure, sir. I will share it with you and you can and forward it to the participants. Thank you, sir. So thank you, all the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your valuable knowledge. Looking forward to you know attend more lecture together, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all the participant and with the permission of all the participant and Rohit sir, I'm ending the session for the day.